Ladies and gentlemen, to depend upon your judgment and to fulfill my own obligation, I submit the facts, fully aware of my responsibility to my client and to you as defense attorney. The American Broadcasting Company presents Miss Mercedes McCambridge as defense attorney. When Martha Ellis Bryant chose law as a career, she accepted the challenge of defending the defenseless. Jimmy Leonard was one of the defenseless, a 16-year-old newsboy charged with hit-and-run manslaughter. He is being held at the Midtown Precinct, where Martha Ellis Bryant is summoned by Judd Barnes. I want you to see him, Marty. I want you to talk to him. Lieutenant Levis will be back any minute. He'll okay the visit. You're pretty upset about this boy, Judd. I've known him since he was two feet high, and I don't think he's guilty. Well, the police must have had some reason for bringing him in. He owns a hot rod. Keeps it in a public garage near the paper. When he went in this morning, the fender and a headlight were smashed up. He took it to a body shop to have it straightened. The police picked him up and nothing flat. Because of that man who was run down on River Street last night? Yeah. A couple of people who were waiting near the ferry slip said they saw a hot rod come zooming along and kill him. Jimmy's hot rod isn't the only one in town. Half the kids who peddle our papers have ones just like it. But not with a smashed fender, is that it? Somebody might have backed into the car in the garage. Jimmy says he didn't drive it last night, and I believe him. Why, Judd? Usually you're the doubting Thomas. Marty, it takes somebody pretty cold-blooded to run a man down and then beat it without stopping to help. And this kid isn't cold-blooded. Judd, he's just a boy. He might have been frightened. Not that frightened, Marty. Oh, hi, Ed. Hello, Lieutenant. Hi, Judd, Miss Bryant. Ed, Marty wants to see Jimmy Leonard. How about it? I guess somebody better see him. He's going to need help. What do you mean by that, Ed? I mean he killed a man on River Street last night. You want to make book on that? Save your money. I've just come from the lab. His car was in the garage all night. Not according to the lab report. There's a blood trace on that smash fender that matches the blood of the man who was killed. Not only that, but glass fragments at the scene of the wreck fit perfectly into the broken headlight. Can there be any doubt about that, Lieutenant? You've seen enough lab reports, Miss Bryant. Take a look at this one. The car could have been stolen. Use your head, Judd. Anybody did steal it and kill the man, they... They'd have ditched it in some side street. They wouldn't bring it back to the garage. Lieutenant, has the dead man been identified? Yeah, yeah. Name is Fred Rimling, longshoreman. He just finished a job on the docks and was crossing River Street on his way home when that young punk come barreling along. That kid isn't a punk, Ed. Look, Judd, we've been friends for a long time, but I got a job to do this morning. Got to go over to Tenement Row and tell Fred Rimling's wife and two kids he isn't going to come home. It's one of the lousiest things a cop has to do. How'd expect me to feel about that hot rod jockey you're so fond of? Lieutenant, huh? maybe you have proof that Jimmy Leonard's hot rod killed Fred Rimling. But you haven't proved that Jimmy Leonard was driving the car. Maybe not, but I can prove that he lied. He claims he was home all last night. I spoke to his old man a half hour ago. The kid hasn't been home since he left the peddler's papers yesterday. Now, if you still want to see him, go ahead. Better you than his old man. What do you mean by that? I mean his father doesn't think as much of him as you do. I let the old man in to see him, he'd beat his brains out. And believe me, I'm tempted. Yeah, I'm sorry I blew it, Judd. Thinking about myself, I guess. Got a bad hour ahead of me. Yeah, it's my fault as much as yours, Ed. I didn't know about Rimling's family. I better go. I'll clear your visit with the desk sergeant, Miss Bryant. We'll take you back to the cell whenever you're ready. Jimmy, Miss Bryant can help you, but she can't do it if you won't talk. I've told you everything. You haven't told us where you were last night. I was home. Your father says you weren't. Maybe he didn't hear me come in. He was sleeping. I got up this morning before he did. I see. Jimmy, how big is the place you live in? Not big. Kind of small. How many bedrooms? One. Where do you sleep? Pop and I share the room. We got to in beds. How about your mother, Jimmy? She's dead. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't know that. No, it's all right. Jimmy, where were you last night? Jimmy, I've always been a friend of yours, haven't I? Well, sure, Mr. Barnes, you've been swell, then but Then I... why should you lie to me? Where were you last night, son? I, I was... No, no, I, I can't tell you. Jimmy, are you refusing to protect yourself, or are you trying to protect somebody else? No, I, I can't tell you, that's all. I just can't tell you, so... Well, why don't you go away? Why don't you leave me alone? Come on, Marty. 
I guess Ed was right. No, just, just a minute, Jimmy. Did you ever lend your car to anybody? Was there anybody who might have had a duplicate of the ignition key? No. I was the only one who ever drove it. I only made it a month ago. A bunch of us made them. We chipped in and bought parts so we could get them wholesale. Mm-hmm. Did any of the other fellows keep their cars in the same garage? Yeah. A kid by the name of Rembrandt. I don't know his real name. We call him Rembrandt because he goes to an art school at night. And Frankie Cutter. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're the only ones. Say, look at lady. What, what can they do to me? Well, Jimmy, you're just 16. And if they find you guilty, you'll be sent to the state reformatory until you're 21. That's five years. Jimmy, five years. Think, son. Look now, I, I didn't kill that man. I didn't drive last night. The car was never out of the garage. All right, so the car wasn't, so the police lab is crazy. But where were you? Judd, leave him alone, darling. It's no use. Come on, I want to see those other newsboys. Jimmy's in kind of a jam, huh? A bad jam, Frankie. Yeah, I understand you have a car just like his, Frankie. Uh, sure, a bunch of us got him. We all made him together. Uh-huh. Do you keep yours in the same garage? Got to keep it someplace. What a racket. Eight bucks a month garage rent. I could leave it in the street and save the dough, but the cops keep slapping tickets on it. Hey, you got a butt, Mr. Barnes? I'm out. Uh, sure, Frankie. Here. Thanks. Guess I ain't got no matches either. Here, I've got a lighter. Ah, that's a good letter. Look, if my old lady sticks her head in here, grab the weed fast, will you? She screams like an eagle if I smoke in the bedroom. Frankie, uh, did you happen to see Jimmy Leonard any place last night? No. Oh, why? Do you say I did? No. To your knowledge, has Jimmy ever gone around with a girl? A girl? Jimmy, he's too square. Uh-huh. Is your car in good working order, Frankie? A dream on wheels. I got a carburetor on that, baby. You ought to see it go. I knock off work mo uh, in the mornings about uh, 4.30 and head for the speedway. A lot of hot rod guys there in the morning, you know. So uh, there's no traffic and we can race. Ain't hey, nothing can touch that heap of mine. Do you do that every morning? Sure, it's kicks. Did you do that this morning? No. No, not this morning. I was too tired, you know, beat. Hmm. Where was your car last night while you were working? Was it in the garage? Where else? Is it there now? Of course it's there now. Rembrandt's too. Yeah, we know. We've already spoken to Rembrandt. Well, thank you very much, Frankie. Judd, we better go. Sure. Stick around a few minutes. The old lady went out to get some cake. She'll fix you some coffee or something. No, thanks, Frankie. Thank your mother for us. I don't want to get up and see you to the door in my pajamas. I ain't got no bathroom. It's all right, Frankie. We'll find our way. Goodbye and thank you. Sure. Some classy dame you got there, Mr. Barnes. Keep her covered so she shouldn't get cold. <laughs> yeah, I will. So long, Frankie. How do we get out? I think we came in through that door. This other one must be the kitchen or a closet or something. Uh, right you are, Princess. Marty, what do you think of Frankie? I feel sorry for him. Yeah, I know what you mean. Tenement Row isn't the ideal setting to grow up in. My folks used to live in a place just like this. You grew up all right. I was lucky, Marty. I learned how to put words together until they made sentences. Huh? Street level. There's the door. Ooh, like the end of a dark tunnel. Judson, I know you have to get to work, so I can take a cab to Jimmy Leonard's house, huh? Yeah, I'm afraid you'll have to, Marty. I'll drop you at a cab stand. All right. You still want to see Jimmy's father? Yeah, I do. And when you get to the paper, will you check around a little, ask some of the other boys if they saw Jimmy last night? Yeah, sure. Maybe one of the... Hey. What is it? Lieutenant Liebus just coming out of that building across the street. Well, there's his car. Hey, Ed! Ed! Yeah, he sees you, Judd. He's coming across. Ah, that must have been where Rimling lived. Leave us said, Tenement Row. Yeah, I know. Hi. Hi. Hope you didn't come down here to see Mrs. Rimling. No, Marty had to stop in the neighborhood. How is she, Lieutenant? Uh, a couple of neighbors with her now, and the minister in the church. She'll be all right, I guess, if she isn't left alone. <laughs> Two cute kids. Look, Judd, I, I want to ask a favor. Huh? Well, sure, Ed. 
Your paper makes a pitch for somebody every once in a while to get help for him. Fred Remling's family can use some help. I get right on it, Ed. No insurance, no nothing. Kill coming from work last night. The first work he'd had in three months. In three months? Longshoremen should be busier than that. There's a lot of shipping. Yeah, well, for some reason he'd been on layoff yeah. till yesterday. Longshoremen's union had a meeting yesterday afternoon. He was elected delegate. I guess that helped to get him working again. Uh, I better get back to headquarters. Where are you going? No, I'm going to the paper. Marty's going to see Jimmy's father. Lieutenant, John, would you mind doing something for me? To help that kid up. Well, what do you want? I want you to check the license plates on Jimmy's car. Then check the registration. Make sure the motor number on the car is right. What's the reason for that, Marty? Well, it's just a possibility. Rembrandt and Frankie Cutter have cars exactly like Jimmy's. One of them might have switched parking stalls and license plates. I just want to make sure that Jimmy's car is Jimmy's car. Look, Miss Bryant, his key fit the damaged car. He drove it out to a repair shop. A fella can always tell his own car, even from others, just I like... No, Lieutenant, but just the same check it for me, will you? I'll come down to see what you find. After I see Jimmy's father. I told him. I told him a hundred times if I told him once that that card get him in trouble. Now look at him. Behind bars. Well, tomorrow morning he'll be arraigned and transferred to the county jail. And then you'll be able to see him. I don't want to see him. Not unless I can get my hands on him. I'd like to break his neck. Mr. Leonard, what kind of father are you? The kind he should have listened to. I've been too easy with him. He's just like his mother was. Blood will tell. That's what she'd do, too. Kill a man and run. She never had the guts to face anything. But he's a 16-year-old boy. He's alone, he's frightened. And he may go to a reformatory if he's found guilty. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, I never should have kept him. She wanted him, I should have let her have him. They're two of a kind. Who? Who are you talking about, some girl? I'm talking about his mother. Well, isn't your wife dead? How do I know? I haven't seen her in ten years. She wanted him, but she couldn't get him. But when I got finished with that divorce court, I showed him what she was. You mean you divorced your wife and you got the custody of the boy? The court found she wasn't a fit mother. The court find that you were a fit father? I did everything for him. I tried to make something out of him. It's almost unbelievable how far justice can miscarry. What do you mean by that? You never wanted that boy. I took him. I made a home for you him. You took him so that you could do just what you've done. Not because you wanted him, but so that you could punish him. So that you could get revenge for whatever you think your wife did to Say, you. Say, who do you think you are to come in and talk to me like this in my own house? Now, get out of here. When you see that son of mine, tell him I hope they keep him in jail forever. I will, Mr. Leonard. I will. Because compared to the home you've given him, his life there will be paradise. <laughs> Well, there's the check on the serial number of the motor, Miss Bryant. It tallies with the number on the registration slip. Well, then I'm sorry I bothered you, Lieutenant. It was just an off chance. Oh, uh, Judd called a few minutes ago. He's on his way over to meet you. Thank you. Has Jimmy Leonard said anything since I left? No, no, he's still clammed up. You know, that fool kid. If he hadn't run away, the charge wouldn't be so bad. A year, maybe, but that hit and run. What happens to a kid's brain, Miss Bryant? It's an accident, not murder. He was speeding, sure, but why didn't he stay to face it? I guess he was afraid to face something else. His father. Yeah, he think he hated the kid. You know the kid's guilty, don't you, Miss Don't Bryant? ask me that, Lieutenant. My job is to defend him. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm sorry. Uh, I got some work to do, but you can wait here for Judd, okay? Yeah, fine. Oh, oh sorry, Ed. Yeah, speak of the devil. Here's your bow now, Miss Bryant. Got time to grab a bite with us, Ed? Cops never eat or sleep. You know that, see you. Any luck, Marty? Yeah, all bad. Uh, I've got some bad news, too. Jimmy was definitely lying about where he spent the night. Why, do you know where he was? At the Hotel Saverin Plaza. The Saverin Plaza? Yeah, there's a newsstand in the lobby. One of the men on a delivery route was making a drop there, and he saw him. We might have been just walking through. That hotel opens on two streets. Uh-uh. Delivery men saw he said Jimmy at the desk registering. 
said he called to him, but Jimmy turned his face away. He said he thought maybe he'd made a mistake. Did you check with the desk clerk? Yeah. Jimmy was registered, all right. Not only that, but he'd been there before. For some reason or other, he stayed at that hotel about one night a month. Gee, it's strange, a boy like him in a hotel like that. Yeah, and there's something even stranger. He'd always call in advance and make a reservation. Marty, you think he was meeting somebody or something? Yeah. Yeah, I do, and I think I know who. His mother, Chuck. His mother's dead. You heard him tell us that. If she's dead, Jimmy's father doesn't know about it. They were divorced ten years ago. Oh, Judd, that boy's not guilty. He's hiding something. Well, he won't talk, Marty. You saw that. Maybe we can find something to make him talk. You go back to that hotel and go through that register. See if a woman has also registered there on the same days that Jimmy did. Get all the information you can on her. Because if we find her, I think we'll find Jimmy's mother. You may have something, Marty. Why don't you come with me? No. Oh. Got another stop to make. Yeah, where? Down at the docks. I'd like to know why Fred Rimling only got one day's work in three months. Hey! Hey, you sister! Yes? Down these docks ain't no place for a lady. Hoists and everything, you might get hurt. Thank you very much. I'll be careful. Hey, wait a minute. Don't go. I ain't finished talking yet. You let go of my arm. You've been nosing around the docks all afternoon asking the longshoreman questions. You shouldn't do that. These guys got to work. I don't think what I do is any of your business. It's all my business. I'm Joe Boston. You're wasting their time and they all work for me. Oh, I see. You're Joe Boston. Ah. Heard of me, eh? Yeah, this afternoon I've heard quite a lot about you. Fred Rimling worked for you, too, didn't he? Yeah. Poor Fred. I just sent some flowers. Bad thing. Poor guy getting killed like that. Leaving a family. I bleed for him. Bleed what? Ice water? Look, you're a pretty fresh dame. What do you want around here? I want to find out why Fred Rimling worked only one day in three months. Docks are slow, that's why. They're loaded with shipping. I've been talking to the men. And I know why he didn't work. Oh, all right, sister. Tell me. He didn't work because you have the contracts for all the unloading done here, and you make the men kick back part of their pay. Yeah? Get one of them to say that in front of me. Oh, you know they're frightened of you. But Rimling wasn't, was he? He was ready to fight you. That's why the men elected him delegate yesterday. He was a communist. Always making trouble. He was not a communist. He went to church regularly, and all the men around here respected him. (laughs) One day's work in three months. And a late job, too. One that brought him out on River Street at 3 o'clock in the morning to be killed under the wheels of a car. A hot rod driven by a crazy kid. You blaming me for that? No, I'm not blaming you yet. You let go of my arm. Sure, 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 I'll let go of it. But let me tell you something. Stay away from these docks. Stay out of my business or I'm going... Or what, Buster? What's the matter, Marty? Judd, he's... You're a bonds, ain't you? Newspaper guy, eh? That's right. And Miss Bryant happens to be the girl I'm going to marry, and I don't like to see her having trouble. Come on, Marty, I'll take you home. Keith. I'm pretty happy you came along. I looked for you all over the docks. Lucky I found you. Yeah. Rimling was breaking up a racket on him, Judd. Boston looks like a man who wouldn't stop at any murder. Are you sure? He shakes the men down, a pay kickback. A couple of them hinted at it, but they're afraid. Ed Lee was suspected Boston of strong-arm stuff before, up to and including murder, but he's never been able to hang it on him. Marty, what's the connection between Joe Boston and Jimmy's hot rod? I don't know. I keep thinking Jimmy's car was switched with another one just like it. But Levis has proven that's wrong. Yeah. Over there is where Rimling was killed, Marty. Coming out of Pier 37. Witnesses who saw the hot rod were in that ferry shed there. The car came speeding along from that direction. Yeah. Oh, hey, Judd, what, what did you find out at the hotel? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. The kid's mother was at the hotel on those nights, all right. Her name's Mrs. Helen Goodrich now, remarried. Comes from Pleasant in a hundred miles upstate. I called her, told her what's happened. She broke up, Marty. She's she's on her way here now. Oh, good. That boy sure needs her. She loves him, Marty. I could tell by her reaction. Judd, she... look out. Watch. Look, what? Wow. Oh, that crazy cab driver. He almost skidded right into us. It wasn't his fault. It's this road. It's like glass. An oh, oil truck overturned here a few days ago. I tried to sand it down, but it's still slippery. You hear the sand and gravel kicking up under the fenders? Yeah. Yeah, I do hear it. 
Judd, I want to see Lieutenant Levis. I want to see him right away. Well, why? What are you so excited the about? The car that killed Rimling must have driven through that oil slick. Yeah? I got an idea. An idea that may prove Jimmy didn't kill Fred Rimling. Now, wait a minute, Miss Bryant. Wait a minute. Give me that again. Slow. Lieutenant, huh? the car that killed Rimling must have passed that oily spot on River Street, right? Yeah, so? Suppose it was not Jimmy's car. I got a short answer for you, Miss Bryant. If it wasn't Jimmy's car, Jimmy's car wouldn't have a smash fender and headlights. There are two other cars like it in the same garage. The night man admitted he was asleep. Any one of those cars could have gone in and out without his ever seeing them. Okay, what's your point? Her point is that Rimling might have been killed by one of the other hot rods. How did you happen to pick Jimmy up, Ed? You know how. Judd, we put out a bullet into all repair shops to report a damaged hot rod. And you got a call on a car with a smashed fender and headlight. Yeah. And it's good, solid evidence. But would it still be solid if you could prove that an undamaged fender and headlight were removed from Jimmy's car? Right in that garage? And the damaged ones put on in their place? Ed, it could happen. Yeah. I never thought of it, but you're right, it could. Yeah, but how can we prove it? Your lab can. By that oil slick. The death car came through it. And that oily sand hits up under the fenders and some of it sticks. It did on my car, Ed. I checked to see. That's proof, Lieutenant. You have the lab go over Jimmy's car again. If he did drive through there, there'll be traces of oily sand under all four fenders. But if you only find it under the damaged fender, then that fender does not belong on Jimmy's car. <sighs> Miss Bryant, if I ever kill anybody, you've got a client. Hello, Libus. Call the lab. Tell them I want a crew at the police garage right away. Uh, Ed, better send somebody to look at those other cars, too. The ones belonging to Rembrandt and Frankie Cutter. If one of them made the switch, he'll have oil and sand under three fenders. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll bet on Frankie Cutter's car. Frankie told us he used to go racing every morning. But he admitted that he didn't the morning after Rimling was killed. Sure. He missed the races because changing that fender and headlight took time. Uh-huh. Where's he lived yet? Let's see. Oh, it's almost 9 p.m. He should be at the newsstand by now, 5th and Madison. Uh-huh. Hello, give me radio division. A radio, Lieutenant Levis. Put out a pickup for a kid named Frankie Cutter. He's a nosy. Fifth and Madison. Have him brought in here and hell till I get back. I, I didn't kill him, I tell you. I was working the news. Save it, Frankie. You're cooked. The lab crew can prove that you switch fenders on Jimmy's car. Might as well tell the truth. Come on, Frankie. Give me a butt, will you? I'm out. You can smoke later. Okay, okay. I changed the fenders and the light. But I didn't kill nobody. I was at the stand. Somebody else had the car. Who? Oh. If I tell you, he'll kill me. He's a big shot. The stuff, real big. Got connection. Maybe we can tell you, Frankie. It was Joe Boston, wasn't it? Huh? How'd you know? Was it Boston, Frankie? Come on, talk. Yeah, he... He came by the stand that night. I had my car in the alley. By the movie, you know? Every time he picked up a paper, Boston, I mean, he slipped me a buck. A big guy, you know. So it's about 2 a.m. when he comes by. He wants to know, can he borrow my car? To a guy like him, you don't say no. So I give him the keys. And when did he come back? About 3.30. Tells me he had an accident. The thing is smashed up. The fender and the headlight. Give me a butt, will you, somebody? Here. Here. He gave me a C-note to keep my trap shut. I didn't know what happened. When I took the car into the garage, the night guy was asleep. So I glommed onto a fender and a light from Jimmy's car. Next morning, when I found out a guy would have killed, I, I was scared stiff. I couldn't say nothing. Boston had laid me out. Enough, Lieutenant? Plenty. Radio division. Radio, leave us again. Another pickup. Joe Boston on a 224... No, I'm not kidding. This time he rides. Come on, Frankie. Where are you taking me? I didn't do nothing. You're a material witness. I want to keep you alive until Joe Boston isn't. You're lucky we picked you up. He's right, Frankie. Boston knew we were asking questions about him. When he picked up his paper tonight, your tip might have been more than a dollar. He'd shut you up for good. When they bring him in, you ain't going to put him in the same cell with me, are you? No, but I ought to just for kicks. Come on, move. Well, I'm putting this one in. I'll let Jimmy Leonard out. We'll wait. Marty, thanks. You saved a good kid. Jimmy'd have to be good if he weren't. He'd have gotten into trouble a long time ago with that father of his. That man is a real... 
Is, is Lieutenant Liebes here or Mr. Barnes? I've got to see one of them right away, please. I'm Mr. Barnes. You must be Jimmy Leonard's mother. Yes. Yes, where is he? Let me see him, please. It's all right, Mrs. Uh, Goodrich. Mrs. Goodrich. Jimmy will be here now in just a minute. He's, he's being released. Re- released? Mm-hmm. Released? You mean he's all right? They know he didn't do anything? Mm, yes, yes, they know. Mrs. Goodrich, he wouldn't tell them where he'd been that night. Do you know why? Because of me. My husband. Not Jimmy's father, Mr. Goodrich. He doesn't know I've been married before. I I never expected to see Jimmy again after his father divorced me, so I, I never told Mr. Goodrich. I see. Since the divorce, I didn't see Jimmy again until last year. I came to do some shopping. Saw him selling papers and recognized him. A mother knows. I had to see him after that. We met once a month. Take it easy, Mrs. Goodrich. I was afraid to tell my new husband. Afraid I might lose him if I told him now, so late. I guess that's why Jimmy wouldn't say where he was. He knew I was happy. He didn't want to bring me into it. Yes, but you'll have to tell your husband now. I did. Right after Mr. Barnes called. I don't know now why I was afraid to tell him before. I got a good man this time. He's out there in the car. He wants me to bring my boy home with us. But I can't. He's still a minor. The courts gave his father custody. Mrs. Goodrich, you take the boy along with you. You leave the rest to me. I'll get that decision reversed if I have to spend my life in a courtroom. Thank you. I don't... (gasps) Jimmy! My baby! Mom! Mom! Come on, Jim. (laughs) You know, Marty, you worry me. Why? Well, there's nothing a man dreads more than the prospect of being married to a woman smarter than he is. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Doc. No? Why not? Because if I'm really smarter than you are, I'll be smart enough to never let you know it. Oh. All right, that's a deal. Now, give me a kiss. I don't want to. Come on. Well... Well... You have just heard Defense Attorney starring Mercedes McCambridge with Howard Culver as Judd. Tonight you heard Tony Barrett as Lieutenant Liebes, Tom McKee as Boston, Joel Nestler as Jimmy, George Peroni as Frankie, and Irene Tedrow as the mother. Music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey. (laughs) Defense Attorney was written by Joel Murcott. The program is directed by Dwight Hauser. Next week, another exciting adventure with Mercedes McCambridge, Defense Attorney. Be sure to listen. This program came to you from Hollywood. America is sold on ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.